Um, I am Judith Butler. I teach at the University of California at Berkeley. And um, about 30 years ago, I wrote a book on gender called Gender Trouble, which, um, as predicted, uh, caused me a great deal of trouble. <laughs> Um, but um, for a long time, that work uh, remained in the academic sphere, and then um, it became part of a queer and gay lesbian movement. And then uh, what happened uh, it, more recently, I would say, uh, starting in the um, in the '90s, but but uh, becoming more and more. Um, um, explicit and powerful in the last few years um, uh, is that it became uh, one of several books um, that um, uh, were very strongly attacked by what is called the uh, anti-gender ideology movement. Now I know that um, uh, this is a movement that began with the Catholic Church, the the Vatican, and I'll explain that in a moment. It became allied with the evangelical church throughout South America. And it is, of course, also alive in the Pentecostal, uh, in the Pentecostal movements in Africa um, and differently throughout Africa. But uh, it is, of course, it is there. Um, and um, so one of the issues I'd like to speak about today is, um, well, what is this thing called gender that um, many people, especially um, religious conservatives, but not exclusively religious conservatives, are quite uh, upset about? Um, uh, so, um, so let me give you a little history. I'll give you a formal paper for about 20 minutes, and then we can open this up for a more general conversation. I hope that that suits you. Um, mm -hmm. The idea of something called gender ideology emerged in the 1990s when the Roman Catholic Family Council warned against the idea of gender as a threat to the family and to biblical authority. Um, although one can trace its origins to the Family Council documents, it has traveled in ways that track the political power of the Vatican, as well as its newly formed alliance with the evangelical church in Latin America. One could uh, approach the topic by offering an academic argument uh, that disputes the claims made about gender. What they say about gender is false. Um, and that is, of course, important because they do say <laughs> false things. Um, but such an academic task um, goes only part of the way in trying to understand why gender, this concept, this category, um, has uh, become so controversial, um, inciting rage and fear um, across many communities across the globe. Uh, the reason for that incitement are, I think, various, and sometimes they're rooted in local struggles, um, but they're also linked, especially through internet petitions and newsletters that construe gender as a threat to the family um, uh, and to the distinct values of masculinity and femininity, um, uh, society, destroy society, um, the church, uh, and civilization itself. So it appears um, that the proposition that gender is a social construction, that simple proposition, um, leads to the conviction um, that individuals could radically choose their gender or live in ways that are unconstrained by their biological status at birth, uh, uh, heterosexuality, and heterosexual marriage. So the idea that gender is a social construction is um, invested with enormous power. Sometimes it has the capacity to take down civilization 
as we know it. And the Pope, our present Pope, Francis, um, has said precisely that. Um, so uh, at stake here is a notion that um, the doctrine of social construction, when you say that gender is socially constructed, you're saying people are free to choose their gender. So social construction is reduced to an idea of radical individual liberty. Um, and there are many reasons um, to reject that reduction. But I want to suggest that reduction has happened in the popular reception of gender. Um, among those who uh, put forth such a view are, um, uh, is, is Joseph Scala, who published a book in Argentina which was widely read in Catholic communities and then uh, was uh, translated and wi widely distributed by the evangelical church in Brazil. And um, that book was against gender ideology. It warned against voluntarist and destructive potentials uh, carried by the concept of gender which, and it was condemned, gender was condemned as inimical to both science and uh, religion. It's hard to be, have both science and religion as your opponents, <laughs> but gender was understood to be uh, an unacceptable by both science and religion. In the subsequent, subsequent years, gender became an issue in several major uh, elections in Brazil, Costa Rica, Colombia, France, Switzerland, and Germany, and then more recently in Hungary, and even more recently in Poland. Um, uh, in all of these contexts, gender is understood as an ideology, meaning a mystified form of thought that refutes the reality of sexual difference and seeks to appropriate the divine power of creation uh, for those who wish to create their own genders, right? So gender gives God's capacity to create the world to individuals who are now vested with the capacity to uh, create their own genders. So the idea of social construction in, in that argument is uh, understood as divine creation not personal liberty, but divine creation. Okay. In other reasons, uh, um, in, Ger in Germany, for instance, in other regions like Germany, gender ideology or indeed gender studies, the academic field, is regularly, regularly characterized as totalitarian. Um, and, uh, and it is, uh, it suggests that it prescribes or dictates gender roles um, and suppresses personal liberty, right? So in some cases, gender is a radical expression of personal liberty. In other cases, it is the radical suppression of personal liberty and, the, and, and a dictatorial mandate by gender academics who will tell you how to live your gender, what is the right way, what is the wrong way. Okay. So uh, in Brazil, uh, the very idea of the nation and of masculinity itself, which are linked, um, is, is understood as threatened by gender ideology. And gender ideology is characterized as a cultural import from the North. Um, uh, further, in all of these cases, there seems to be no interest in what the actual field of gender studies is. Um, I know you have a gender studies program there, at Macare. Um, uh, what kinds of debates are held in gender studies programs? What kinds of works are read? Um, uh, uh, what are its regional variants? How does it change in different parts of the world? Um, uh, but whether it is, um, gender or the term gender ideology or a reference to gender studies as a monolithic uh, field of some kind, it is invariably referred to as a kind of phantasm. It becomes a very potent phantasm that deflects from the fact 
that hardly anyone who opposes this matter has actually read texts within the field or considers their arguments. So one of the characteristic features of the anti-gender ideology movement is that it is not based on a careful reading or examination of the actual uh, claims that are made. Certain phrases are taken from context and uh, inflamed and made into what I would suggest are phantasmatic entities. Um, for instance, in, in Switzerland, I was once approached by a woman um, after a lecture, and she let me know that she was praying for me. And I, when I asked why, why are you praying for me? Uh, she explained, well, gender is diabolical. It comes from the devil. And she hoped I would find redemption um, uh, for my responsibility in circulating the term or the theory or the phantasm. When I asked her whether she had ever read my work, she exclaimed that she would never read any book on gender, <laughs> that it was out of the question. She would never read any such book um, since it comes from the devil, apparently. And as I was trying to ask whether she felt fine about dismissing a book she had never read, she already moved towards the door. Okay. Um, the Pope's Family Council in the 1990s uh, was then uh, directed by Joseph Ratzinger, who was, of course, um, uh, the Pope, Pope Benedict. Um, or became the Pope um, shortly thereafter. And he warned <clears throat> that gender theorists were imperiling the family by questioning the notion that appropriately Christian social roles could be derived from biological sex. He, he argued that it was in the nature of sex, of a woman's sex, of a man's sex, uh, for women to do domestic work for men to undertake action in public life. So he derived a sexual division of labor from biology, but he also grounded biology in a divine order, a Christian order. The arguments were, of course, starkly pre-feminist, which is perhaps one reason why the first objection on the part of the Catholic Church to the concept of gender was considered odd, even amusing, by feminists who did not then anticipate the implications of the opposition. Ratzinger made public his concern at the Beijing Conference on the Status of Women in 1995, and then again in 2004 as head of the Pontifical Council on the Family, and in a letter to bishops underscoring the potential of gender to destroy feminine values important to the church and to destroy the natural distinction between the two sexes. As Pope Benedict, he went further in 2012, maintaining that such ideologies deny the preordained duality of man and woman and deny the family as a reality established by creation. Because he argued man and woman are created by God, those who seek to create themselves deny the creative power of God and are misled by an atheistic set of beliefs. <clears throat> by 2016, Pope Francis, despite his occasionally progressive views, continued the line developed by Pope Benedict. And this is what he claimed, and I quote, we are experiencing a moment of the annihilation of man as the image of God. He specifically included as an instance of this defacement, the ideology of gender. <clears throat> he was clearly outraged that today, and I quote, today children, children are taught in school that everyone can choose his or her sex. And this is terrible. Then he made affirmative reference to Benedict and claimed God created man and woman, God created the world in a certain way, and we are doing the exact opposite. It would appear from this perspective that humans have taken over the creative power of the divine, 
But Pope Francis went further. He argued that proponents of gender are like those who support or deploy nuclear arms. Now, this is his analogy. And that their target is creation itself. <clears throat> this suggests that whatever gender is, it carries enormous destructive power in the minds of those who oppose it. Indeed, it, it carries <coughs> an unfathomable and terrifying destructiveness. It's represented as a demonic force of destruction pitted against God's creative powers. And this is one reason that gender is understood as exercising demonic powers, a diabolical ideology. Perhaps it was renewed papal support um, of the fight against gender in 2015 and 16 that encouraged bishops throughout the world to escalate the anti-gender ideology campaign into an international project, one that crosses hemispheres, affecting elections, as I mentioned, in Colombia, Mexico, and Costa Rica and recently playing a significant role in the election of right-wing uh, Jair Bolsonaro as president of Brazil. His inaugural speech in early January of 2019 contained a commitment to eradicate gender ideology in the schools, and he vowed to resist ideological submission and since being elected, he has sought to eradicate sex education and replace it with a curriculum that enforces the idea of binary gender difference and the natural and normative character of heterosexual marriage. In October of 2018, Hungary not only eliminated gender studies from the list of approved master's programs, but forced the Central European University known for its international gender program to relocate to Vienna in part because of its sponsorship of Western academic projects such as feminist and gender studies. After the successful legal battle for gay marriage in France in 2013, a backlash took place the following year. A prominent course curriculum in France called ABCD de l'égalité offered students a way to think about the difference between biological sex, the sex you are born with, and cultural gender, the sense of gender that you uh, acquire or that emerges for you in the course of living a life. And it was rescinded after strong public accusations that gender theory, la théorie du genre, was being taught in the primary schools. Pope Francis met with one of the organizers of the effort to withdraw the program. In Argentina, the Pope's country of origin, um, interestingly enough, um, the most progressive laws on gender freedom were passed some just a few years ago in 2014. Those laws, a gender identity law, which is similar to one uh, that exists in South Africa, um, uh, allows any person to choose to change gender without medical authorization. Um, and in 2014, in reaction to that progressive gender identity law um, passed in Argentina, um, uh, Jorge Scala started to circulate his book among Christian communities um, throughout Latin America. And in the Spanish region of Andalusia, the ultra-conservative Vox Party has recently petitioned the center-right Ciudadanos Party to combat what they call the jihadism of gender. So gender is jihad, gender is totalitarian, gender is taking the place of God. We have three separate fantasies of what gender is. Um, one thing I'd just like to interject at this moment is that the anti-gender ideology movement is what I would call a, a counter social movement. It's a, it's a counter movement. In other words, its aim is to destroy a movement that it sees as uh, gaining power um, 
uh, gaining legislative victories, gay marriage, trans rights to change your legal sex, um, uh, reproductive rights for women, um, um, sexual and economic equality for women, uh, anti-discrimination laws that protect gay, lesbian, non-gender conforming people and trans people. So as those movements, the trans, queer, gender, feminist movements have made, uh, have, have succeeded with legislative victories and new legal reforms, this counter movement has emerged to, de to devalue, discount and destroy that social movement. In other words, it doesn't always have um, other aims. <laughs> what it seeks to do is restore an order it believes to have been destroyed by these uh, progressive uh, social movements. Now, I would suggest um, that the aim of this movement, the anti-gender ideology movement, is not simply to eliminate the word gender, although there is I mean, throughout the world, a lot of resistance to the term, and we can talk about it. It is, after all, an English term that has come into many languages, and many people say, no, this does not work for us for interesting reasons. Um, uh, and it's not even about censoring the academic field of gender studies or the theory of gender as they imagine it. Um, it's seeking to undermine the justification for a wide range of social movements that have shown themselves to be powerful enough to achieve legislative and legal victories in the past 20 years. The alliance of right-wing Catholics and evangelicals, which has not always been a happy relationship, right? They're now very close in their opposition to gender. <coughs> that alliance has a clear platform uh, they oppose feminism, LGBTQI rights, especially gay marriage, trans legal and medical rights, single mothers, so the rights of single mothers, um, gay parents, the rights of adoption, and more. My wager is that as neoliberal economic policies devastate the work lives and the sense of futurity for many people who face contingent labor, unemployment and unpayable debts, the turn against gender is a way of shoring up a traditional sense of place and privilege. So that is one thesis I'd like to give you today on how to think about the underlying conditions of this, um, what I'm calling um, uh, following Elizabeth Corridor, uh, a counter movement. Um, now, it also, of course, draws the line uh, between public and private, the anti-gender ideology movement. It, it wants to redraw the line between public and private. Uh, the family is private and its organization should not be uh, intervened upon by any other uh, authority. Um, and its patriarchal privilege should not be contested because that's what gives the family order. Um, uh, and, um, and, and in a way, uh, we might say that the, fa the traditional family is shored up or justified against market forces, incursions from the North, uh, especially from uh, the United States and the Euro-Atlantic Cultural and Economic Alliance. Um, but, uh, but also um, uh, as a way of handling the enormous anxiety that neoliberal economic orders has unleashed throughout the world, where austerity and precarity become the norm and unpayable debt becomes a way of life. Um, I would suggest that both the nationalist and the traditionalist investment in prohibiting gay marriage, gay and lesbian families and their adoption rights, trans and travesty rights, single parent adoption and access to reproductive technology, um, uh, that, um, that this, uh, this investment um, is focused on this term gender 
But gender is a fairly empty term. What it does is it serves as a kind of umbrella concept under which all these social movements uh, are, uh, are uh, uh, included. Um, uh, you don't have to know what gender is or even say what it is or very much about it to use it as, as, a, as a term that abbreviates and encompasses a whole range of uh, social movements that have to do with bodily self-determination, equality, and expanded rights for gender and sexual minorities. Um, the, the heteronormative family is now being defended, sometimes violently defended, as the sole defense against devastating market forces. And I believe that this is especially true in a place like Brazil. The anti-gender ideology movement has taken hold in the wake of gay marriage legislation, arguing that religion ought to be the arbiter of marital arrangements and that progressive legislation ought not to undermine the heterosexual family with its distinct natural and hierarchical roles for women and men. Opposing or reversing inclusive trends in family law and demanding new laws that prohibit forms of procreation or adoption outside the traditional family form, as well as changing genders assigned at birth or, or affirming the equality between men and women all work to this end. So the wager that I'm suggesting here today is that as neoliberal economic policies devastate the work lives and the sense of futurity, for many people who face contingent labor, unpayable debt, the turn against gender is a way of shoring up a traditional, a traditional sense of place and privilege. Um, and we can talk more about that. I mean, I don't mean to be suggesting simply that there's an economic crisis and that the debate about gender is a cultural debate, which is an effect of the economic crisis and can be understood fully that way. I think that the interconnection between gender, household management, household economics, and neoliberalism has to be unpacked um, a bit more carefully to understand. But I do think that the defense of traditional family, for instance, the defense of so-called traditional family in Brazil or in Argentina is to some extent at odds with the sociological fact that many people are living in kinship arrangements that are not the, not the traditional family. So the society has already changed and new kinship arrangements are already accepted. And yet in the middle of this complexity, the defense of the traditional family emerges. Um, and the reasons for all of that new kinship arrangement are not simply the theory of gender. There are many sociological and demographic reasons for those shifts in kinship arrangements. And yet uh, the defense of the family seeks to restore um, uh, an, a notion of the family, which may also be a kind of ideal rather than um, um, a, a simple existing historical family. Uh, histor historical form. Um, I want to suggest um, um, this becomes, all of this becomes an intense political issues, especially in countries where state funded social services to families have been decimated and dependency on churches has actually increased for basic services to those abandoned by the state. I say abandoned by the state, but in such cases, many understand themselves to be saved by the state or saved by the church rather. How does that saving dissimulate and continue the conditions of economic abandonment? Although not a model for church interventions cross regionally, the evangelical church in the United States gained much of its power in the wake of the decimation of state funds for AIDS for dependent children, um, as the scholar Melinda Cooper has shown. As asset appreciation becomes the source of wealth and massive cuts in wages, secure employment, and social welfare follow, and as unions and their bargaining powers are increasingly subject to destruction, criminalization, or disregard, 
the heteronormative family assumes or rather reassumes a crucial role and a kind of redemptive role. It's not just, as Melinda Cooper argues, that the family becomes the central site and mechanism for the transmission of wealth, but that family dynasties become popular ideals and family fortunes, like the one that is currently running my country, uh, become exemplary modes of wealth accumulation. The funds the state expended on welfare, including securing payments to mothers and children, in the US, especially in African American communities, became figured by neoconservatives as a drain on the state, um, as an unjust set of claims on the state, and an inappropriate intervention into the family form through legal and economic instruments. The withdrawal of state support with the help of Bill Clinton abandoned poor families, destroying whatever safety net might once have existed. In its place was instated the idea of responsibility that drew upon both individualism and its Christian variants. My point is that what I'm calling abandonment is the very phenomenon championed, as we know, by neoconservatives and neoliberals as sound fiscal policy, a policy that regards as appropriate the withdrawal of the state from private moral and social matters, which is one reason we have a decimated healthcare system in the US and we have no way of rationally handling the COVID-19 uh, pandemic right now. Um, in the US and elsewhere, the authority of the evangelical church has stepped in, not just to give moral order to the family, without which the economy cannot function, but to aid and abet free market economics as it intensifies precarity for increasing numbers of people. The complex alliance between the spread of evangelicism and the support for neoliberal economics is one that I can't explain at length here today. Um, Bethany Moriton has done some of that, and I know that there are also studies in Africa of the relationship between the, Pentecost the Pentecostal churches and neoliberal economic, uh, uh, economically induced precarity, which is something I would like to know more about. Some have argued that it was the legal advances of the LGBTQI movement that spurred the anti-gender ideology movement, especially the right to privacy that struck down anti-sodomy laws but also the legalization of gay marriage. Both have been understood as, uh, as triumphs of an elite, secular, and nihilistic set of social movements galvanized in part by college campuses and compliant corporations. <coughs> These new rights are themselves the sign of the destruction of culture, humanity, sexual difference, or religious authority. The battles against women's rights, trans rights, and the rights of LGBTQI people more generally is regarded as the effort to save civilization, as I've suggested. But it's also very often um, linked uh, uh, as, as a um, um, link to author authoritarianism or indeed to um, um, uh, um, well, the anti, let's put it this way, gender is linked with totalitarianism by those who link anti-gender ideology with uh, authoritarianism and the patriarchal privilege that authoritarianism embodies. So in some ways, the debate between authoritarianism and totalitarianism is at work in the debates about gender. The authoritarian strains of the states that adopt the anti-gender ideology position are sometimes mixed with fascist trends. Um, and I would have to have another paper to explain yet that. But the confusion of discourses is part of what constitutes the fascist structure and appeal of at least some of these movements. One can oppose gender as a cultural import from the North at the same time that one can see that very opposition as a social movement against further colonization of the South. 
The result, though, is not a turn to the left and a fuller critique of colonial cultural imperialism. Uh, the, the result is, in fact, an embrace of ethno nationalism, at least as it gets staged in the anti-gender ideology movement. The social movement of gender rights and freedoms is itself positioned ambivalently. Some human rights frameworks are arguably cultural, culturally imperialist. I would accept that view. Um, but some queer and trans movements are clearly part of an anti-imperialist struggle on the left. I would accept that view as well. When the anti-gender ideology advocates see themselves as energized by anti-imperialism, as they sometimes do, and Pope Francis also uses this language, um, they draw upon the very energies of the progressive social movements that they oppose. And that I find interesting and perhaps a little bit um, uh, pathological. Um, so I, I would like uh, to make sure we have um, time for discussion. So let me see if I can um, uh, move to uh, the last few pages of my more formal presentation. I see that Professor Mamdani has uh, joined us. I'd like to welcome you. Um, I introduced myself. It all went beautifully, not to worry. Um, uh, I would suggest that we understand the historical formulation of neoliberalism and financialization, the imperative to increase assets at the expense of securing fair wages, not as the cause exactly of the anti-gender ideology movement, but as part of the complex scene of heightened conflict where nationalism, racism, and heightened militarism ally with anti-gender ideology propaganda. The focus on the figure of the father <clears throat> in its familial and political overdetermination, the father is the authority of the family, the, the patriarch is the authority of the nation, the line between nation and family is redrawn as one of uh, important patriarchal um, power that must be instantiated and connected between family and nation. Um, the focus on the father is part of this constellation, especially in its relation to fascism, I would suggest. Um, the more fully social services are decimated in favor of private contracts and outsourcing, the more that national wealth is determined by movements within global capitalism that culminate in dispossession and precarity, the stronger the two churches have become and there are more churches but besides these two churches, supplying, as it were, the moral complement to dispossession as well as its rationale. First, the precarity, the economic and social precarity, is one that the church claims to be able to ameliorate, exchanging basic goods for ideological exposure, but also, perhaps more fundamentally, through a process that seeks to mandate and instill a, the singularly moral character of heterosexual marriage um, and the destructive character of all other sexual organizations of life that fall outside of heterosexual marriage. In other words, the strategic abandonment of populations in need at an economic level, together with the refusal to guarantee decent wages or working conditions, facilitates the role of the state as it licenses and protects the maximization of assets without limit. The specific feature of financialization that seems important here is that finance is based on speculation on future outcomes, and it always carries the risk, if not the, um, if not the certainty, of a new crisis, right? It actually requires crisis. It induces crisis. It requires crisis. It thrives on crisis. It may well be, as some have suggested, that the relation between financialization and crisis is a structural one. Well, under those conditions, what sense of future and stability can there possibly be, especially for those who have no power to engage in so-called asset appreciation? Something is clearly destroying a sense of future for many people, for an increasing number of people. 
but how we name that something has never mattered more. The new alliance of Christianity and fascism proclaims that one main cause of this chaos, this threat to the futurity itself, this threat to civilization and society is something called gender. And that is what undermines social structures. That is what's undermining the nation. It's undermining communities, their histories and their futures. That is the name of the imposition from the North. Well, there are many impositions from the North. There are many sources of the destruction of the livelihood of mass numbers of people, of increasing numbers of people. But shall we call the shall we call the, the one source of that destruction gender? Or is gender in some sense embodying, absorbing these massive uh, economic and social anxieties under contemporary conditions? Um, uh, the new alliance of Christianity and fascism proclaims that gender is the threat to futurity. And for conservative Catholics and evangelicals, the instability and chaos that must be fended off um, is that which challenges the normative character of the family. But that argument doesn't take into account the abandonment of families by the state when wages cannot be secured. The problem is not just that men cannot make the living they require to sustain a family, although that is one problem, but also that women, the young and the old, the dependents as it were, are everywhere subject to increasingly precarious work conditions and are, have lost basic social services. This has never been made more explicit than under pandemic conditions. Those who are, uh, uh, they are everywhere, I would suggest, um, subject to foreclosed horizons, uh, the loss of the future, exposed to a moral message that tells them that they are individually responsible for the fact that they cannot predict any viable future for themselves. Those who are gender minorities, gender non-conforming or trans, are subject to these precarious conditions even more intensively, as is the case for queers of color in Bahia, Brazil, for instance. When gender and sexual freedoms are regarded as destabilizing and destructive, we have to ask, from what perspective does this seem true and what other kinds of destabilizations in society are being registered as the fault of gender? Perhaps gender is an overdetermined site where a host of such fears collect and register in such a discourse in the form of a fearful phantasm. Is it sexual freedom that has created this pervasive sense of precarity? Or is it rather that the normative family emerges as the sign and supplement of radical economic abandonment? Is the tacit understanding that the family must be restored in its traditional sense to absorb the blows of the economy or that any challenge to the necessary and normative structure of the heteronormative family will, as a result, expose the population to yet more severe precarity? Is that how it works? Once the family in its normative version becomes installed as the only possible safeguard against chaos and destruction, then it is freedom that is attacked in the name of preserving a social order that is paradoxically under attack by other means, by other forces. And it is also equality that is attacked in the name of preserving a social order, which is traditionally hierarchical uh, and which is uh, under crisis for many other reasons. The state requires the church to oppose gender freedoms and, sex and, and sexual equality, gender equality, in order to reinstall and naturalize modes of masculine authority in the family and the state. But it also does this in order to empower the state to follow financialization as if that were the name for a brighter future, even as it systematically exposes populations to precarity whose political support it requires 
condemning them to a life whose sense of futurity is constantly under threat. So that's the end of my, my formal remarks. I see that it's um, four minutes after the hour. I believe we have some time for questions or for discussion. And I'll leave it to uh, Professor Mamdani to uh, tell us how best to proceed. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Butler. Um, we, have, uh, we have three discussants. Uh, uh, each of them will have about 10 minutes. Uh, if in their enthusiasm they go beyond it, I will, uh, I will give them an extra minute or so, and then, and then we will move on. Uh, following the discussions, uh, uh, you, you, you may want to, to engage with them, um, and then we'll have an open discussion. So those who have comments or would like to ask questions, uh, I suggest that you use the chat function uh, to just uh, put down your name and your institutional affiliation uh, because those who have gathered here to listen to you are coming from different parts of the world and different institutions. Um, and um, if you don't want to uh, say your question or comment out loud, please feel free to put it in full on the chat function and I will just read it out loud. So the first discussion is uh, discussant is uh, Anna Karthik. Anna Karthik is a fifth year doctoral student at Makerere Institute of Social Research. Uh, the second discussant, also a fifth year doctoral student at uh, MISER, the acronym is MISER, uh, is Diana Kamara. And uh, the third discussant is a postdoctoral fellow at uh, Miser Ede Bangerezako. Uh, let's begin with Anna Karthik. Anna, 10 minutes, please. Yes, Professor, thank you. Um, am I audible? Yes, you're audible. Yes, uh, thank you, Professor Mamdani, and thank you, Professor Butler, for this extraordinary uh, opportunity to join in this conversation. Uh, to begin, Professor Butler's reading on the backlash against gender ideology, predominantly in Europe and parts of Latin America, discusses a counter movement orchestrated under the patronage of both the Catholic Church and the evangelic groups to the social movements in support of gender diversity, equality, and sexual freedom. The rhetoric of the church reads a gender ideology as a deception of reality that is divinely ordained in the natural hierarchies between sexes as conceived in the hegemonic heterose heterosexual and monogamous idea of marriage and family values, which in turn claims to define the social values for both women and men alone. Hence, one is not assumed to have the freedom to choose a sex with which they are born, nor are they allowed to decide on their sexual orientations, particularly those which are deviant to the will of God. In looking both existentialist and institutional explanations that gender and sex are socially constructed and to quote uh, Professor Butler, determined by a complex and interacting set of processes, historical, social, and biological, Professor Butler argues that gender ideology is neither destructive nor indoctrinating. Before returning to the question of counter-movement, I wish to begin and engage with the word gender itself. Professor Butler's work has constantly con questioned the rigid dichotomies of gender, challenging the core assumptions of identity politics as we know, while rigorously interrogating the necessity of fixed immutable gender identities. In speaking of the gendered body as performative, in the sense to quote again, forced reiteration of norms, Professor Butler's concept of reputation allows gender to be read as socially imposed or discursive code that is responded to and performed. The central role of performance in the construction and deployment of gender as a form of social and cultural interaction helps to locate the notion of identities as fluid and performative rather than fixed and stable, dismantling a homogeneous and universal applicability to the binary perception of the masculine and the feminine. Here, Professor Butler's work clearly converges with that of a host of post-colonial scholars who have persistently argued against providing a stable identity to gender. Even so, 
the departure in the writings of post-colonial scholars begin with the tracing of genealogy that came with the disruption caused by colonization in its conception of colonial modernity. As Professor Bata did mention, when most languages in the post-colonial countries fail to have vocabulary to differentiate between male and female and man and woman, the pre-colonial historiography presents a reading on the abjection and erasure of the body itself, or those deemed to be deviant under the colonial gaze. Here, I would like to bring in examples from writings of scholars, um, including Ifi Amadume, Oren Kawivumi, and Nivedita Manon. To, so to, be, to begin with Professor Amadume, uh, who states that in pre-colonial Igbo society in Nigeria, both man and woman could be a husband, daughters could assume positions of sons, and they did act as husbands to wives. They're stating that power in this case is assumed in the patriarchal and masculine norm. And Professor Oyarun Kyobizumi's writing on the Yoruba society again in Nigeria argues that the notion of woman is a social category as the body was an essentialized due to gender social identities of man and woman. And it was the biological interpretation through the colonial gaze that created hierarchies of bodies, which were otherwise fluid. And the last example drawn from the writings of Professor Menon, uh, who puts across the case of the poets of the Bhakti movement in India, which began in the sixth century CE and continued to flourish until the 17th century. To quote Professor Menon, Ms expressed a kind of desire for God that travels through the body and reconfigures it, demystifying the body and sexuality by dismantling the codes and conventions that sex the body. Clearly, there are claims that considerable fluidity did exist in Indian subcontinent until the mid to late 19th century, when the processes of colonial modernity began to alter and discipline the body in an attempt to create the colonial subject which unequivocally had to be a gendered subject under the colonial institutional forms of power. This conceived not just on the binary formation of man and woman, but also on the ground of the good woman and the bad woman or the good man and the bad man. This, as in the native man and the native woman. This meant that in my first experience five generations ago, women in my family who did not necessarily cover their upper breast upper body, um, were expected to clothe their bare breasts and enter into a system of heterosexual monogamous conjugal relation of marriage, which was totally unheard of until late century in a matriarchal society in the south of India where women enjoyed sexual freedom and right to property, which means, uh, which also meant that the idea of gendered identity or the gender subjection under colonialism also or it was erased by the fact that there should need to be a dispossession of the female body in terms of uh, uh, the right to property or the right to engage uh, in the sale, sale or the buying of the property in public place or to dismantle the cultural market binary. Um, I do apologize with these detailed examples um, uh, on the perception of the body in colonial and pre-colonial context, but uh, they were invoked to advance the idea that gender in our context, especially in the experience of the global south, uh, still carries the potential to be considered as a disruption to any kind of emancipatory potential towards sexual freedom and diversity of bodies. In this regard, I would like to ask Professor Butler if it is possible to repose the question, who is afraid of the gender, or who is afraid of gender, to that of who is afraid of the body? Uh, because, as you mentioned, and as often as, um, observed, Western gender discourse has a universalizing tendency. The emphasis on gender forecloses spatial and temporal differences in the colonized time and space. Divisive drifts caused by caste, religion, ethnicity are equally critical. Therefore, to move on to the second point, uh, we are currently engaged in the process of writing what we would call, or what I would like to call, counter histories in our struggle for decolonization, including the decolonization of gender. So this compels me to ask, how do we understand the convergence between the counter histories in the post-colonial world and the counter movement backlash in the West? In this backdrop, the counter movement is a double movement or a double struggle. First, countering the colonial legacy, and secondly, countering the effects of the existing conservative counter movements in the West, especially when we do invoke social movements in our context on gender to pursue legal battles against um, the fascist, populist governments, or against the colonial vestiges existing in the legal courts, 
uh, that do not give us or, or the rights to my sexual minorities or the, or the gay marriages or to decriminalize um, consensual gay sex relationships. And if that is the case, and if there is a convergence, uh, it also on the monolithic conservative church and the right wing politics that tend to accelerate to one, the state itself as a structure, the role of international financial institutions, transnational organizations, and donor countries. How do we understand the role of the state itself in the post colonial context? and that of international organizations and the existing struggle between social movements and counter movements, when in Uganda, there has been experiences of a World Bank um, intervening, and not just World Bank, but the donor countries intervening um, in Uganda's policy um, against um, uh, Uganda's uh, policy to bring in law or the bill that is in parliament right now that um, enforces very repressive actions against uh, gay sex relations. So thank you. Thank you once again, Professor Butler, for this opportunity. Thank you, Anna. Um, Diana Kamara. OK. Thank you, Professor, for the presentation. Uh, I should speak for myself and Anna. Very pleased to meet you. And so, the first thing that I would like to talk about is that the reaction of the anti-gender movement that gender movements are diabolical. Of course, if the response to that kind of power is only to attack the power that be, the church or the, uh, the right wings, it would also just be pathological. We would just be caught in this um, limbo of talking about who has power, who doesn't have power. The good thing is that you came in and talked about the actual place where the, all this is coming from, the neoliberal reforms. And that is where my question comes. You do uh, give detailed information on the neoliberal reforms and how it, is, it has affected the family, people, livelihoods. But then, what is the relationship between uh, the world economic order and the church? which seems to be the champion of this anti-gender movement. What is, the, what, I mean, what is the historical relationship? And we, knowing the church, why church, church is based on fear, you know, inflicting fear on the masses. So why gender, why now? You know, there are lots of things they could be hanging on to. There are lots of things they've done over centuries. Why gender and why now? That, that is one. Number two, you talk about this relationship between the right wing and the church, which you elaborate uh, in great detail. But somehow I think you give a free pass to the left because you do not uh, problematize it as much as I was hoping. Because if we are looking at the right wing and the church, what is the left's position, you know? You know, the left, as in the uh, social democrat, is different from the Marxist maybe left. So who's left of who? What is the place of the uh, left in gender and sex politics? And it, uh, that being said, so what is the relationship between uh, the left, gender and sex politics? Are they together? Are there points of divergence? Are there places where only gender and sex would be and the left would be? Now, this is a general comment. The backlash on gender sounds very much like the backlash on communism. You know, totalitarian, it's a jihad, it's a dystopia. Uh, what, from your work, how do you draw from other movements that have been anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist, not to say that, uh, Gender and, gender and sex have been part of these movements, but from those movements, what do we bring forth as part of uh, gender and sex movement uh, against now the anti-gender movement? And now I have another um, concern is that it's, it is good and celebratory that now um, gay, transgender, single parents, 
same-sex parents can adopt children and such because of the legislative and legal battles. But this being a normalizing act, being a legal and legislative act, is in itself normalizing. And it is so normalizing because of the words that are tied to the basic word, gay marriage. Marriage is very problematic. Transgender in the military. The military complex itself is something to be dismantled. Adoption is something that is still tied to the question of birth, the woman's body. So how do we, you know, how do we maneuver that, this normalizing effect that these very battles can have? Now, uh, there, another thing is that I feel like from the presentation, the heterosexual woman has become the other, you know? Because for the most part, how gender used to be equal women, sex has become equal all other than heterosexuals. My question is, where is the place where heterosexual women and men cannot go for the uh, homosexual and all the others? I'm sorry for saying all the others. And where is the place of convergence that we all can meet and match together? That is the question. And my last rounding up uh, observation, you say that this does not seek, uh, the gender movement has been misunderstood as seeking to dominate or deconstruct. It seeks political freedom. I don't think anyone embarks so on a journey just to deconstruct. I don't think any you did not embark on this journey just to just to the to you know to go against what is the system of power uh, uh, that constructs gender. There's something we're imagining. There's something that we want. There's a future that we want. And just like the church, like communism, like terrorism, like any other form of movement. It seeks to normalize itself. It seeks to institutionalize itself. It seeks to, you know, become the order. Of course, uh, gender is always a part of many other things. But my question is, of freedom that you envision, how is it not a form of normalizing? How is it a form of not, you know, and also we're saying we don't want to be dominant, but you still have to dominate for something to work. I could give the example of, you know, socialism versus maybe uh, capital, a capitalist state and a socialist state. A socialist state is still a state. It has forms of violence. It has monopoly of violence. And a capitalist state is still a state. So thank you very much for your time and it's a pleasure. Thank you, Prof. Mamdan. Thank you, Diana. Uh, our final uh, discussant, uh, Ede Bangerizako. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for this discussion. Thank you, Butler. Professor Butler, it's an honor to have you on our platform at MISA. Um, I'd like to begin with a, a quick uh, vignette of my experience with the Catholic Church and its uh, general sense of uh, homophobia. Um, I remember uh, every year, um, Martyrs Day celebrated um, at, at the Catholic Church in commemoration to martyrs that were killed in the 19th century by um, King Mwanga. And uh, one of the arguments is that they were killed. There are multiple possibilities of why they were killed. But the priest told us on Martyr's Day, um, I think about two or three years ago, he told us that um, uh, how would you, people, martyrs were ready to die to fight against homosexuality. But today you are ready to partake in homosexuality and not die. So he was chastising congregants and saying, shame on you for considering homosexuality. Whereas in the 19th century, people were ready to die for it. And then he Im immediately added and said that it's the scholars who are to blame for it. So he, <laughs> he was pointing fingers at the same time. Um, so, so one of the often the accusation that we tend to hear is that it is, 
foreign NGOs which are sponsoring and teaching homosexuality, often denying the agency of the LGBTQ movement, movement and accusing them of being un-African, despite it being traced in the pre-colonial, just as the priest did in the church in front of all of us. So um, how does one then articulate um, political freedom in terms of gender diversity and sexual complexity when it's illegal to do such, um, when the state only recognizes society as het heteronormative and uses its political muscle to fight away any form of sexual diversity as foreign and as unnatural, and also uses it as a tool to mobilize the population and alienates um, those who do not conform as being uh, what should be avoided and what should be punished by the law. Um, so, so this paper shows us how gender, one way if I understood it, offers us a gateway to political freedom with uh, which should be allowed, should, we should be allowed to have such political freedom with a given by uh, choosing, it's explained as a given or chosen gender without discrimination and fear. So how do we not understand this as a privilege? And how do we not first try to understand this in a local and historicized context and to try to understand the power relations? So often today when we speak of gender, it is used to refer to women. Um, when somebody says, oh, let us add gender to a project, immediately it means uh, let's add women or something. Um, but in the 1970s, the gender emerged as a political category, as a studying hierarchical relations of power between men and women. Um, so the call for gender equality, which comes from feminist movements, um, first spoke of women's subordination as universal and a political commitment to the liberation and empowerment of women, which had great results to an, um, a certain extent. So more lib lobbying for representation of women in politics, um, the right for women to be recognized as landowners, um, the right to abortion. And um, so in the scholarship, gender roles were constructed as based on sexual differences. So gender is what is constructed on this naturalized sexual difference, localized in a particular context. So what are the challenges to a, a movement, political movement, which mobilized women on the basis of subordination? So it is with the third wave movement that disconnected the sex gender system and uh, with gender as a social construct, um, which was led by, by yours uh, truly, Prof Butler. So the experience in the South is that um, African feminists always, often had issues with Western feminism, viewing it as a form of imperialism, that it's the white woman's burden of 20th century to rescue the African woman from a priv primitive culture. So it was a, a, a critique of feminism came which focused on the idea of sameness without acknowledging differences regarding class, age, race, and sexuality. So when the movement for equality, the fight for equality came to the South, it assumed the, that was the issue. It assumed that African women were oppressed and um, that generally this is how women are represented in the third world. So um, one of the struggle became, one of the issues for scholars became in the South, would became how do we name this feminism? Um, so they, they were, objecting to this homogenizing of Western feminism. So one way was to call it womanism, to reclaim agency, and um, to stay clear of what they viewed as Western feminism. And as earlier mentioned by Anna, there was the argument for always having a flexible gender system in the pre-colonial where biological sex did not always correspond to ideological gender, um, which was pushed forth by Ifi Amadiume and Noyenon Kereyawumi. And the idea that um, it was during the colonial period that this uh, rigid gender ideologies and strict masculine, masculinized and feminized role emerged. Um, so the, one of the responses for African feminists was to either to go to the pre-colonial and also to focus on motherhood as what is center. Um, that what is privileged in Africa is motherhood and friendship and that one it's not limited to uh, the biological mother, but it can be shared. 
and this was used to refer to woman, woman marriage described by uh, Ifema Diume, where a woman without a child could marry another woman who will partner with a man to produce a child, but the man would play no part in the child's life. So how do we acknowledge the different meanings of gender and gender roles when they cannot be studied in isolation? Rather, as you urge us to study, you urge us to study how women are reproduced and constituted as subjects and how the identity of a gender subject comes to operate in society. So how does a fight for diversity recognize the role of culture, sexuality, ethnicity, nationalism, the state, what the role they play in all constituting uh, subjects? And how do we think of a universal gender equality when the meanings of a what a man or woman means is contextually defined? And especially in a society filled with inequalities, and various forms of, of oppression, where family is no longer, it's no longer the idea of a traditional husband and wife, but is today led by children, such as the case of child-headed homes, or women, or people living together without being married. So that's political freedom. Is political freedom possible? Um, does, does it allow, is, okay, sorry. Is political freedom possible for gender diversity and sexual, sexual diversity in, in states where political freedom is generally limited by the state? When you're only recognized, do I have, as um, if you only behave in a heteronormative fashion, where generally you, you, there's limited way of, of allowing you to act even politically. Um, especially when the state thrives on antagonizing any form of gender diversity and sexual diversity. And so how do we also respond to relations of power among women of different races, classes, and culture? How do we steer away from a Eurocentric focus methodology of paradigms of feminism? How do we avoid um, uh, women in the North, as uh, Chandra Mohanty put it, as the authorial subjects, the yardstick by which to encode and represent cultural others? So what are the strategies that incorporate and acknowledge different power relations, a multicultural environment, histories, contexts that encompass not just gender and sex? Um, one of our own, uh, Dr. Lino Somme, in her book on gender, ethnicity, and democracy and violence in Kenya, she shows us how the feminist, woman, feminist movement for women's rights obscured women's fight for economic security and power. She shows us how the fight for women's rights um, sorry, human rights did not take account of the structural dispossession and oppression under neoliberalism. So it resulted, women, by focusing on, on the fight for rights and human, and human rights, it resulted in working, women, working class women being disenfranchised. So how does a fight for gender rights and sexual diversity not lead to further alienation and loss for the little that has been gained? Thank you very much. Professor Butler. Thank you. Professor Butler. The floor is yours. Uh, well, these are um, these are wonderful comments. I'm I'm very grateful. Uh, you can hear me. Yes, please. Yes. Okay. Um, well, um, uh, thank you, Anna, Diana, and and Heidi, all three of you. I I think um, these are uh, you open up. Um, huge vistas of thought uh, and many uh, there are many journeys we could take from from this moment in our conversation um, and it's it, it's a moment where you you experience the the profound limit of zoom although how beautiful that i could come and visit you like this this morning your evening um, but uh you know if we were able to then have a meal and have a discussion <laughs> we would have hours to elaborate many of these um, extremely important um, issues that have been raised. And I, I must say, I am sorry that we are unable to, um, uh, to meet more personally, to have those discussions and to have a meal, which is a very important part of every discussion, I think. Now, uh, <laughs> um, let me say this. Um, well, first of all, um, Thank you. I mean, it's interesting in the comments, I have a sense of the different projects that are happening 
Eckmeiser and um, the, the different ways you are, you're thinking about these issues. So that's also a gift to me. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I do think it is, um, well, let me, let me, let me say this first. I mean, um, let me talk a little bit about the left and about feminism and what has proven to be um, very difficult political dynamics um, between the two and internal to the two, as I understand it within a broadly global frame. Um, uh, and I must say that the term gender, even if it had a life in anthropology in the 70s and early 80s, and then became part of um, feminism more broadly and queer theory in the late um, 80s and 90s, right? Um, e even though it has that history, um, it was then taken up in what is generally called gender mainstreaming as foundations and corporations and states sought to uh, identify gender with women. Okay, there was no problem of gender. There was no issue of gender except women. And, and basically um, insist on inclusion in any project. It had to be, it had to include women or it had to include women's concerns. Um, gender mainstreaming was a way of separating um, the social movements that were concerned with gender from um, uh, public policy and state regulations that sought to establish gender as a factor of an analysis in sociological studies, as a category of inclusion in foundations and social policy, um, and which didn't destabilize the term, right? So the destabilizing effects of gender as a category, oh, what worlds does it open? What future does it open? What ways of life does it make possible? What does it destigmatize? What does it allow us to recover from, from a pre-colonial era? Um, all of these questions are not the questions that gender mainstreaming cares about. Gender mainstreaming was about setting an agenda which had inclusion and equality as, um, as, as the framework where inclusion and equality were very often decided by uh, the Ford Foundation <laughs> um, or, uh, or state authorities or uh, public health officials or, or, and very often feminists who entered into governmental policy. But that really in some ways uh, was, a, was a move that was a, it was a success in the sense that, oh, people are caring about gender now within a liberal order, um, but it was also a loss of a more radical social movement. Um, and I think um, we also uh, saw that play out in the realm of, of human rights discourse. Um, in human rights discourse, uh, the, not just the feminist <clears throat> agenda, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> not just the feminist agenda, but the gay and lesbian agenda, and I'm gonna say gay, lesbian, rather than queer, because there is a distinction here, um, uh, was also to a large extent, if not fully, uh, developed within the North American or Euro-Atlantic framework, and did very often impose cultural norms in the names of, hu of human rights. So within gay studies, lesbian studies, queer studies, feminism, there was a critique of the imperialism of the category of gender. There's a critique of the human rights agenda that doesn't really care what the regional, local um, uh, uh, situation is because it has a universal concept of what gender is or should be, or what sexual freedom is and should be. And that was um, in large part imposed in certain ways. Now, um, you know, I'll give you sort of two examples of uh, my, that illuminate my kind of two views on this issue. 
on the one hand, um, because I worked in on, on Palestinian uh, freedom struggles for some time, and I met um, uh, with Palestinian activists in who are queer and who are anti-occupation and who are anti-capitalist. Um, it became clear to me that. The, the, the models of gay liberation, the models of, um, of feminist liberation were not ones uh, that were communicated through certain human rights doctrines, were not ones that would easily be taken on. And they were disruptive and they were even sometimes very dangerous because they exposed people to dangers that were not acceptable. They didn't want hyper visibility as a norm. They, wanted, they, they were not willing to be part of an identity movement right? Just, I'm queer, and that's all I am, and that's all I care about. That was not also anti-occupation, anti-imperialism, and anti-capitalist. And they, it was very clear that, that those struggles were interlinked. And the human rights doctrine kind of came in asking them to identify only as gay or lesbian and to accept a certain model of emancipation, which they were not interested in. They wanted to network. They, they wanted to stay below hypervisibility, they wanted ways of negotiating the problem of visibility, that, that they were not allowed by certain um, Euro-Atlantic norms, and, and of course the, this coincided with, um, um, with some of the very intense is, Islamophobic and anti-migrant discourses that were emerging in Europe, and which often, you know, in the case of Amsterdam, say, allied with gay rights, right? We, we're gonna protect our gay people against migrants from North Africa, from Turkey, from the Middle East, etc. So, you know, it became very frightening to see how those kinds of agendas could be taken up for, for massively racist, imperialist uh, purposes. And, the, um, and it became all the more imperative for, um, for work on queer, trans, feminist issues to be um, to be allied with and to be analytically uh, combined with um, uh, an, 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 uh, a, a movement to oppose occupation, continuing colonialism, post-colonial reverberations <laughs> um, uh, with 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 the critique of capitalism, with, the, um, with, the, with various demands for political self-determination and equality. So, you know, that, that's very, very clear. On the other hand, I've been working with a feminist movement in South America where the opposition to torture and the ability to name torture and violence against women and violence against trans people, femicide, feminicidio, all of these social movements require the human rights framework to come and interrupt the local cultures where femicide was accepted as a way of life, right? So they wanted the interruption. They have the critique of cultural imperialism, but they also want that interruption. And, and they, had, they saw how the human rights framework, to some extent, when it was politically mobilized in the right way, could bring... Uh, torturers to accountability, right? So I actually have two views here. Like, on the one hand, um, uh, the, the human rights of gay and lesbian peoples, of trans peoples, and the gender mainstreaming can be part of um, very, uh, very um, uh, unacceptable uh, political formations, and they can get co-opted, assimilated, and and instrumentalized uh, in, in ways that are, are really horrible. We see that uh, in the state of Israel, um, uh, among other places. Um, but um, on, the, on the other hand, there are some, um, there are some, some, some movements that have needed, the, needed a human rights framework in order to establish as criminal the the wanton killing of women, the wanton killing of trans people, of, of travestites, of th that, that this is not an acceptable way of life. It is a crime. Uh, and, and those who do it should be held accountable. Now, 
there's a lot to be said about this, but I, I do think that it, it makes the case for contextualization. And it also makes the case that human rights say, or gender politics per se, they, they don't stand on their own. They are always contextualized in local and regional uh, situations, in power dynamics, and in alliances, which can, which can make them, in fact, uh, complicitous with repressive regimes or uh, part of uh, emancipatory projects that are imagining a different future and are laying claim to the right to, uh, to realize that, that, that different future, which, which involves substantial equality and substantial freedom rather than freedom as personal liberty or equality as you know, ex assimilation to existing neoliberal orders. Um, I was also very mindful of the fact that um, that for a long time, um, you know, applications from North Africa to uh, the Ford Foundation would not be considered unless um, unless unless it was about uh, outlawing clitoridectomy. It was the only thing that they were willing to fund. <laughs> it's like if you had a literacy project, like no. If you had a social equality project, no. The only thing they wanted to do was establish a kind of backward or barbaric Africa and that they were coming in as the saviors who would bring Africa into civilizational norms. And that, it was an explicitly imperial project. And it also was not attentive to or responsive to what the actual, you know, needs of an organization may be. And I, I've seen foundations do that in Palestine as well, like where they, they fund projects that normalize uh, a problem, a, a, a question of inclusion, like oh, Palestinians have to be included, and 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 separate um, uh, the the human rights project from a, a more radical social movement. So that's where I stand on those issues. I mean, that's that's my basic view: is that one always has to be thinking about that. I. I also think um, that throughout my travels, I have many people who have said, you know, this word gender doesn't work for me. It's, it's an imposition in, in, in China. They have four different uh, ways of expressing gender. Um, in, uh, in, in, in Japanese, you know, gender is an inflection of a verb. It's not a substance, you don't have a gender. <laughs> uh, so there are some colonial dimensions of gender theory that have imposed a kind of syntax and grammar and way of thinking on languages and cultures that don't, that don't have that. It, and it is like, you know, I mean, the right in France, the, the reactionary right, uh, treated gender theory as if it was this horrible American import. And, um, and I, and it was, it was as, it was as if it were like another McDonald's, you know, coming set, being set up in the Champs Elysees or something like this. So, you know, I, I, I get it. Gender does not always work as, as a category. In fact, what I think is most important right now is that gender become a problem for translation. Let's just treat it as a problem. You know, it doesn't mean, it, obviously it doesn't mean one thing anymore. <laughs> uh, and it's become uh, a public discourse that's highly contested. What's happening at the site of gender? Uh, where is it translatable? Where is it not translatable? What does it mean when gender doesn't translate into a language? Well, that shows you that it's got a provincial or local character that has been masquerading as universal or generalizable when it's not. So I think we should not accept gender as a universal theory, and we should not let it be appropriated to the universalizing tendency of feminism. I think that we, 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 we understand gender as a contested site and as a problem for translation, um, and that that opens up the local and the regional and the vernacular in a way that um, otherwise is, um, is, is suppressed or violated. Uh, so there, there is a critique of gender as a, as, a, as a colonial import that is important to have. What is strange and perhaps uncanny and paradoxical about the right-wing appropriation 
is that they call it um, an import from the north um, and they call it a colonial import, but the response to it is ethno-nationalism, right? It's like, let's go back to the nation. Let's go back to ethnicity. Let's cleanse ourselves of all global elements. Let's become closed down and 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 indeed, to the degree that it comes to stand for all Western incursions, including financial ones, um, uh, uh, we get this uh, very problematic reactionary formation where the suppression of gender freedom, sexual freedoms, feminism um, is is precisely what um, what seems to hold out the possibility of renewal or security. Um, uh, let me, uh, I, I see we don't have a lot of time left, but I, uh, and there were so many incredibly interesting um, <clears throat> questions that you asked me. Um, <coughs> I don't think gender is the only term for thinking about um, the question of how our sexual lives are organized or how our kinship relations are organized or what's the connection between feminism and LGBTQI movements. It, it, it doesn't have to be that term. Maybe gender dies as a term. Maybe some other set of terms become more important or more capacious and more responsive. So I'm not, you know, um, it would be tempting to just, oh, I'm going to defend gender against its attackers. But I think that it's more important to uh, analyze the attack and also see the weaknesses on the part of the left. So I, I appreciated that you, you asked me to do that. I mean, unfortunately, there's also a version of the left that thinks um, <clears throat> that all of these issues, gender, sexuality, uh, family formation, reproductive rights, Par parenting options, that all of these are secondary and that we should be focusing on more basic issues. And that brings back the specter of primary and secondary oppressions. And, um, and that's, that's, a, that's a major problem because in fact, uh, gender is involved in the conception of the public sphere. Gender is involved in the conception of politics. Gender is involved in the conception of economics. It's not as if it can be disarticulated, put into the private, and understood as secondary. Or even, oh, once we get rid of capitalism, then gender inequalities will fall away. That's not true. Even that notion of primary and secondary is a gendered hierarchy, right? Where we're all, bit, we're all serious minded politicians if we are looking just at the economy, and then we are doing secondary work if we're looking at sexuality and the household. The household has always been part of the family, has always been part of the economy. Um, household labor, how we, how we think or imagine the family, um, how care is organized. These are at once economic and social issues. Economic functions are culturally articulated. They're never disarticulated. So, you know, that's one of the issues that I would really fight for, that we not go back to primary and secondary, um, which is why I think we have to think carefully about how um, the notion of economic precarity is affecting um, is affecting populations all over the world and, and affecting them in a way that goes into the question of gender and sexuality and family formation and law. Um, I, I also, um, um, I guess I would also say, um, um, that in a, in, a, in a larger project, I'd like to think more about what the, the deep cultural um, presumptions have been um, of gender theory and to work through um, the problem of gender as, a tra as translation and that this is linked to the kind of work that I've um, uh, presented to you today. I'm sorry that I wasn't able to 
go more deeply into all your wonderful questions and comments, but um, it's great. I don't know if I'll hand this back to Professor Momdani at this point. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Professor Butler. So I have a number of messages from a number of persons saying how much they have appreciated the, this talk, but that they're having technical problems hearing and uh, so they can't really ask a question. Um, but we have, uh, we have individuals who have registered to ask questions. So I'm going to recognize uh, three persons. The first uh, uh, comment question uh, comes from uh, Professor Josephine Aichire, uh, who is the principal of the College of uh, Humanities and Social Sciences here at Makerere. Uh, the second question comes from uh, uh, David uh, Ngendo Shinda. Uh, David is, has just finished his PhD at, uh, at Miser. And the third question comes from Dr. Sara Sari. Dr. Sara Sari is the head of the School of uh, Women and Gender Studies at Makerere University. Uh, Josephine, please go ahead. We'll change the order. Um, Sara, can you go ahead? Hello. Uh, hello, Sara, please, please go ahead. Yes, I did raise a number of questions, but mainly I was asking how the, it, it, we all know that for a long time the church has the church has framed or has even shaped economic engagements. So why now are we focusing on neoliberalism other than looking at that relationship between religion and capitalism in a very historical and contextual manner? Thank you. Uh, Josephine, are you back? Uh, no, David, please go ahead. Um, I, I was wondering, uh, what, if, what if we extended the field of um, interpretation of Simone de Beauvoir, uh, one is not born a woman, one becomes one, to, to something like, uh, one is not always born male or female, but one becomes one. So my, my question to, to do this is, what could what could be constructive or deconstructive about that possibility? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Josephine. Is not there. Not there. Um, yeah. Uh, do you want to, uh, to to engage with these, Professor Butler, as we wait for Josephine? Or is there enough to chew on? Or uh, yes, of course, there's more than enough, and we yeah. can go back to some other topics as well. Yeah. Um, well, uh, first of all, thank you very much. Um, I mean, I think that um, uh, Sarah is um, is is right to to think um, that perhaps this could uh, this whole issue could be uh, approached um, through a consideration of religion and capitalism. Uh, I think I think that's that's right. I. I fear that um, many of the frameworks we have for thinking about religion and capitalism tend to um, understand religion as um, offering an ideological expression and justification for capitalism. Um, so um, the work on, on, on capitalism and the Protestant ethic or um, ways in which we think about um, religious fundamentalism as um, uh, ex expressing prior economic relations. I mean, th this is this is very it's very helpful. I think there are many different histories to be told. I um, I think that it's important to realize that the church is also an economic power of enormous proportion, and that. Um, uh, 
the Vatican, as you know, has a huge amount of money and it helps to uh, uh, sustain and uh, finance uh, many of the church networks around the world. Um, it also has access to the media and it has access to small communities. So it can work at very global levels and it can also work in very local ways. Um, uh, and, and it's also a, a, a real estate owner, right? I mean, it owns enormous land. Uh, the, um, and we can, uh, we, we can think about it in, in many ways, um, uh, for sure. Uh, I, I don't mean to say that uh, contemporary precarity, as I've been describing it, um, is something that couldn't be situated in terms of a, a history of, um, of poverty or a history of the abandonment of populations in a, you know, through various biopolitical um, policies and strategies. I think, I think that's possible. But it's very interesting to me, you know, the, that Pope Francis, for instance, he was originally part of um, liberation theology in Argentina. And according to that view, the, the Bible should be read through the perspective of the poor. And it was an emancipatory movement in, in some extremely important ways, both in Argentina and Brazil. Um, and, um, and some of that language uh, appears again in his more contemporary um, an analysis. So for instance, he worries that local cultures, the poor in particular, are being subject to this colonial construct called gender. Um, but what he has effectively done is to efface the fact that indigenous peoples throughout the Americas, but also in Africa for sure, um, indigenous peoples, local cultures have had much more complex ways, much more complex vocabularies for describing gender, for describing third spirits, for describing household arrangements that are non-normative. So what he does is he defends the poor against this imperialist construct at the same time that he faces the local cultures that he's actually seeking to defend. Um, and that's that's quite a strategy, I think. And it also tells us something about how uh, liberation theology has been displaced by the, uh, new, um, the new conservative uh, agendas, both within the Catholic Church and the evangelical church that have this anti-gender ideology focus. Um, I mean, it's not just anti-gender, it's also anti-migrant, it's also anti-socialist, it's also anti-Marxist, it's, and, it, and it understands gender to be part of that left, which would bring back totalitarian power, and it also shores up an, a notion of authoritarian power, which is fundamentally patriarchal and instantiated in family structure and government alike. So, um, Unfortunately, the many churches in, in Latin America where liberation theology was the dominant theology have, have now, um, um, are now uh, or have now replaced liberation theology with anti-gender ideology um, and, and, and the renewal of patriarchalism. Uh, and that's a, that's a very worrisome shift and Pope Francis does represent that shift in some fundamental ways. Um, David's uh, remark is, of course, a really important one because of the, um, um, the fact that intersex uh, infants, infants who are born with, um, with no clearly demarcated uh, sexual difference or who have a combination of characteristics, um, uh, uh, intersex Infants are, are not born male or female. So, um, so it is the case that one is not always born male or female. We cannot assume that every infant emerges in the world and is male or female. In fact, the way in which a doctor looks, the way in which the law frames sex is right there 
the scheme of observation belonging to the medical establishment, the legal regime that to some degree controls or infiltrates the medical observation, decides what's, what's female, what's male. And, and don't worry, I'm not saying that there aren't some observable differences. There are, but observation becomes complicated when bodies are intersexed. And in fact, intersex is a continuum. So there are, there are often questions, how do we name this? How do we name the sex of this infant? Um, and the term gender, I mean, let's be clear about it. It, was, it emerged first um, in this grammatical form with the work of John Money, who was assessing, treating uh, intersexed infants. Um, he referred to them all as hermaphrodites. And uh, he also thought, sought to correct them so that they would be brought into society as either girls or boys. Um, and, and it was a, a pathologizing discourse um, and a normalizing discourse. But when he asked what gender is this infant, he was saying, something's wrong here, we don't know. So the term gender <laughs> emerges first it, from a state of confusion about how to classify sex, like how to observe it, how to name it. Um, and then gets taken up in a non-normative way by feminist anthropologists and then becomes part of queer theory uh, much later. So I actually come in on the third wave of gender discourse. Um, that said, uh, one is not always born male or female, but one can become one. And one can become one not because of one's personal choice. Personal choice might have some play in this, but sometimes it's what categories come to bear on you, what social institutions name you, what family and community norms come to uh, interpolate you and to um, uh, offer you recognition in terms of those existing categories. Um, I don't believe one is radically free to choose one's gender. I don't think that we exercise personal liberty in ways that, that defy all cultural norms. That's actually not my position, although it is sometimes attributed to me. I think uh, we, are, we are born into cultural categories, we're born into uh, we are named and 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 we take our bearings within that practice and we find our way and the ways we negotiate that is what we might call choice or we might call agency or our own personal power but you know it's it's not as if we leap out of our cultural settings and become something radically new i don't think i don't think that's what happens um i, I would like to uh, uh bring this conversation to a close, um, not uh, take undue advantage of uh, Professor Butler's presence. Um, Miser seminars are normally three hours long, uh, which usually seminars in uh, North American universities are two hours long, at least the formal seminars. So, um, so I'd like to bring it to an end with the last round of questions. Uh, Professor Aichiri, although she's not here, did send us a question on, on, on chat. Uh, I'll just read it out. Uh, she says, this is a great conversation. I would like Professor Butler to address herself to the nested nature of this fear of gender and the hidden power of motherhood. And further is this connivance of religion and fascism and further is this connivance of religion and fascism new in any way? Or should not the issue be how we deal with this renewed alliance at the level of theory and social movement practice? Um, the second question uh, coming from Evarist um, Gabirano is also on the question of the Catholic Church and Evarist really wants to know, he says, you mainly focus on the position of the Catholic Church and mainly the ideas of Pope Francis, who seeks to protect the family. It is obvious that the church has constantly preserved a conservative stance upon these issues, but it is also observable that Pope Francis has expressed some liberal ideas. For instance, his views on divorce in case of abusive marriages. Could you have any sense if there are some positive elements we could learn from the church? And the final 
the third question uh, is is from uh, uh, Yosef uh, Jamberi, who is a fourth year doctoral student advisor. And Yosef will ask it. He's he's in the audience. Yosef, please go ahead. Um, Yosef, can you hear me? I'm just going to send you a chat. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, so uh, I would like to ask uh, um, Professor Judith Butler on this. Um, so one of the essays you sent us for uh, for this presentation by uh, uh, Elizabeth Corridor, if I pronounce her name uh, correctly, uh, she speaks of the dialectical relation between uh, social movements and counter movements. So I, the question I wanted to ask is: uh, Do you also this? Do do you also see this relationship as a dialectical relation in the Hegelian sense? And if so, uh, do we in a way need counter movements to constantly reinvent? our struggle, uh, the struggle of uh, emancipatory social movements? Do they have independent existence uh, of that of, uh, yeah, thank you, Professor. Professor Butler, please go ahead. Um, <clears throat> well, um, thank you again. Um, I do think that there is um, an, there's an I interesting uh, question that Sarah raised um, about the uh, power of motherhood, I believe, um, first, and um, whether that is a power that anyone actually owns, <laughs> whether it's a power that is a property that can be owned within a set of property relations. Do men own it? Do, do husbands own it? Does the state own it? Do women own it? Um, and uh, one, one fear I have is that, uh, um, is that when we think of um, that power within property relations that we tend to misunderstand or misdescribe that power. Um, I do think there is a, it's interesting that mm, when, um, that the, the power of giving, giving birth, for instance, which is different from the power of caretaking, um, uh, are, are two different powers and very often someone gives birth and some other group of people take care. Uh, the mother is perhaps not always a single figure. Maybe the mother is a, a field or the maternal function is distributed in many ways. Um, but the very fact that it's labile and that it can't always be mm, controlled um, could be understood as a source of anxiety. Um, and when you think about the colonial efforts to establish normative family structures or to impose them upon uh, pre-colonial organizations, um, that would be a very interesting way to think is something about the suppression of that shared or distributed power uh, being, being targeted. It's also a bringing women back into the home and singularizing the idea of the maternal so that that power is, is contained and indeed uh, often understood as owned. Um, the denial of reproductive freedom, uh, including abortion rights, uh, is a clear attack on the idea that women could or should choose uh, whether or not to give birth or that women can separate their sexual lives from their procreative lives. Um, or that 
there are ways to procreate that don't necessarily involve heterosexual reproduction and that that separation works to the advantage of some people. So the disarticulation of motherhood, you know, procreation, family, this is, um, it's a chaos uh, and a frightening one for those who oppose um, family formations, whether old or new, um, that, uh, that move outside women as property, um, that contest women as property and their, uh, their, their birthing power as, as, a, as one that could be owned or, or, or contained. Um, but I also think um, uh, that, that there are, we have to have vocabularies outside of property for describing what we mean by that power. Um, I think as well um, that um, what is um, paradoxical, um, maybe a kind of negative dialectic, is that the family is, um, is burdened as social services are destroyed. And the only support for the family is churches and their communities and the social services they provide, which then allow for the state to continue to withdraw those uh, ser social services as public goods. Um, and to the degree that the family and the church have to uh, be reconsolidated and reconnected um, for this particular economic system to work and for the state to be increasingly relieved of its economic burdens and, and its obligation to care for the poor and the precarious. Um, we see a, a very particular coordination of religion, state, and capitalism that I do think belongs to the present moment. It would be great to have that history, but, but contemporary precarity is linked to the anti-gender ideology and also linked to the increase in authoritarianism and the, um, uh, the, the abandonment of populations through financialization. I think that's a very specific kind of abandonment. And I don't think it can be assimilated easily to prior formations of capitalism. It would obviously take me a longer period of time to explain that. But I do think that is maybe specifically new. I mean, it, the, the more radical claim would be there would be no anti-gender ideology movement without financialization and, and the production of radical precarity for an increasing number of people. That's the framework that, I, I, that would allow me to say this is a new version of an old problem. Um, I do think that, um, look, Pope Francis has met, I'm not against Pope Francis, you know, this is not the point. I'm against a certain line that the church has taken, starting with Benedict and moving through Francis. And it was a deep disappointment to me that Pope Francis took this view that gender isn't a diabolical ideology. It was, it was shocking to me because he came in, he cared about the poor, he was more open to homosexuality, he seemed less punitive, um, he seemed uh, in, more open to divorce, he seemed open to letting priests possibly get married. He, you know, there are many issues where he's been quite commendable. But the family council is the, the, the church vehicle through which this particular position has been elaborated now for 30 years. And, um, and there's no way he's going against that. And unfortunately, um, he, he saw this as, as something that was um, uh, a position that he wanted to take, and he, and he did do so. So it's not about Pope Francis himself. In fact, you know, I've often thought that uh, there must be people in Argentina who <laughs> knew him when or could talk to him or... And, and indeed, there are groups within the Catholic Church, very many progressive groups, including gay and lesbian groups and, and progressive anti-poverty groups within the, within the Catholic Church that have tried to reach him and tried to have some, some, uh, some effect. So they, even the Catholic Church as such is not a single monolith. It's, it's, a, 
it's surely a contested site as well. Um, well, about the idea of a counter movement, um, I mean, counter movements of the sort that Elizabeth Corridor describes are are somewhat weak because they don't have an independent agenda. The, their agenda is to defeat a social movement. Um, and I think, you know, we could argue, well, maybe we should just call them social movements, but they're not quite social movements. They're not trying to achieve, you know, freedoms or powers or uh, uh, visibility for a social group. They are, in fact, trying to discredit and destroy, sometimes through threats of violence and actual acts of violence, um, <clears throat> social movements that they um, consider to be um, uh, dangerous um, for all the reasons we talked about today. Um, I don't think we need co counter movements to reinvent ourselves. I think what we need is for various movements on the left to allow their conflicts to come into productive antagonism and to reinvent ourselves as we see the exclusionary or the the uh or the problematic character of our of our different movements right i mean like the 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 gay human rights effort which is islamophobic that doesn't work you can't you can't fight the discrimination uh of one people by engaging in the discrimination against another uh uh, Buddhist violence against the people of Myanmar. I mean, <laughs> we might, we might, we might want to defend Buddhism uh, for any number of reasons, but we will not accept um, uh, the commission of violent crimes in the name of an ostensibly nonviolent religion. Right? This is a contradiction, and it's one that can't happen. So we reinvent ourselves when we see the limits of our framework, and, and that can happen on the left, and it does happen on the left. I, I have seen that happen. So I'm not sure it's strictly dialectical, although, look, uh, dialectical analysis can be really important. I mean, I think one of the worst things that ever happened to the feminist movement and maybe the gay, lesbian, trans queer movement as well is that multinational corporations decided to adopt uh, policies in defense of gender equality and um, to bring those policies into the various areas of the world where they dominate and exploit. And then many of the people who are exploited by those multinationals look and see that mm, the multinationals are allied with gender, you know. Uh, so Gender, if it's to exist or be part of a left social movement, has to make clear its critique of the multinationals. It has to, it has to be bound up with struggles that are anti-capitalist and that understand the specific form of corporate and financial power and are part of that struggle. That's the only way, in the same way that a gay human rights agenda can only work now if it's part of a, a uh, a, a struggle that's anti-racist and anti-colonial and um, and defends the rights of migrants. Um, these these cannot be disarticulated. Um, but those alliances are are rough because not all those people want to stand next to each other or um, or be part of the same group. And and those conflicts are generative. So maybe what we can take from dialectics is the idea that conflict can generate a new scheme or a larger scheme or one where the internal differences are able to uh, exist in a dynamic and sometimes conflictual relationship to one another. I think we have to get used to conflict as part of unity um, and, and um, I suppose another part of my work is to say that conflict doesn't have to be violent to be generative. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to say a word uh, about our own work here uh, before, before we close. Um, uh, our work uh, is, is informed by uh, two engagements. One is a very local engagement uh, with the power under which uh, we must function and the society of which we are a part, and the second is a more global engagement 
uh, with uh, scholarship, the world of scholars, the debates that drive that world, um, works like your own work. Um, just a word about the, the, the local context. Um, we have a, a Makerere is a public university. Uh, the, the, the government uh, shapes some of its policies and, and uh, this is a government which uh, uh, has a very contradictory uh, relationship to the question of gender. Uh, on the one hand, it, uh, uh, it claims to, and not just claims to, but actually does stand for gender inclusion in the way in which you've described it. Uh, special seats for, for women in parliament, uh, representation of women at different levels. Um, it is, uh, uh, it, it, it's almost an ideal representative in the region for what Janet, Janet Halley has called uh, uh, governance feminism. Um, and on the other hand, uh, it seeks to constantly marginalize and undercut uh, what is new about gender. Uh, to undercut the radical potential of gender as part of a larger endeavor to undercut the radical potential of the humanities. Uh, so we have statements constantly, public statements, not constantly, but periodically, uh, and, and uh, uh, so that we've come to expect these uh, uh, statements uh, uh, demeaning uh, why do we have humanities? Uh, why do we have studies of women, uh, gender? Um, we, we have these statements from the head of the state, actually. Uh, they, they tend to close public discussion rather than open it up. Um, your talk today, uh, put in this context, um, you've clarified a number of existing concerns for us, but you also opened up new vistas. Uh, we, we will know it, uh, we'll have a better sense of it as discussion unfolds in the coming days and weeks and uh, months, but I want to thank you very much. Uh, one of the amazing things about this, uh, this, this COVID-19 uh, uh, distance learning is that uh, it is so inexpensive in a way. I mean, we've had to pay internet bundles for the students but we didn't have to pay a ticket for you uh, or hotel or, or anything, you know, and, and we have this global audience in a sense. Uh, but notwithstanding that, I do want to give you an open invitation. Post COVID-19, please come to Makerere Institute of Social Research. Um, let's uh, uh, sit, eat, drink, relax, talk, converse, get to know one another. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Oh, yes, I'm, yes. I'm muted. Uh, thank you so much. I'm, I really appreciate all the questions and all the thoughtfulness and thank you for your generosity. And uh, this has been a great pleasure for me. We overcome our confinement in a provisional way uh, to connect with one another. And that's, uh, that's an uplifting thing for all of us during these days. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye, everybody. We'll meet next week. We'll make the announcement on, uh, on email.